wanted to thank my uh, colleagues at the University of Iowa. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Shira Simon. She's our neuro-ophthalmology fellow this year. Cole Starkey and Jan Full, our research assistants, and Mike Wall and Matt Thurtell, uh, our other two neuro-ophthalmologists. And uh, I wanted just to cover what we've done with a ready valve recently, recording the photopic negative response in patients with different forms of optic neuropathy and also measuring their pupil response uh, with the same instrument at the same time and seeing how both of those can be combined uh, to help understand the diagnosis if there is an optic neuropathy and also how they respond to treatment. The actual, the motivation for trying to do this, because other people I'll show the literature have, have done this in optic neuropathies, is that we're also studying uh, blood flow in the eye with a laser speckle device and uh, causing changes in blood flow with light stimulation and other maneuvers. And we're interested in how the blood flow to the eye is influenced by the metabolic state of the intraretinal neuron. And since in most optic neuropathies, you're blocking the conduction downstream, <clears throat> and, we're, and all the tests that we have to measure that <clears throat> whether they're behavioral, like visual field testing, or pupillary light reflex, or evoke responses from the visual cortex, those are all downstream of the block. We don't really know what happens to the status of the evoked response of the intraretinal neuron when there's a block, you know, distal to that. And so we wanted to find out what the status was of those neurons and how it corresponded to blood flow in the eye at the time of the test but I'm mainly gonna present the preliminary results of the photopic negative response and the pupil response in these patients. Um, most of you in the audience already know this. I mean, standard clinical tests are over here, and the ancillary tests that we often use, at least in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic, are here. And on the right are really the objective tests that we have at our disposal right now to try to understand <clears throat> how much of the retina and what, what layer of the retina is involved in different optic nerve diseases. And so, as I said, our goal was to evaluate the intraretinal neuron status and compare that to downstream proxies of the, of the state of optic neuropathy. So just graphically, what we deal with in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic are a number of different types of optic neuropathy. They could range anywhere from an inflammatory optic neuropathy to a compressive optic neuropathy to a ischemic optic neuropathy, toxic, hereditary. But most of the action is here, not really in the retina itself. But of course, you'd think that the damage there would have an influence on the proximal soma of those ganglion cells. But we don't really understand the timing of that. If you had an acute optic neuritis and had very poor vision today, does that affect the electrical response of the soma and the retina? And if it doesn't, how long does that take to have an effect? And is that a surrogate for whether treatments might restore vision in that patient? So we're also interested in using it as a predictor of what's the chance of recovery. Uh, most of you probably are acquainted with the photopic negative response. Most of the uh, literature is using a flash photopic negative, but what Quentin has designed for the ReadyVal is a steady state 3.4 hertz uh, average signal with a red stimulus on a blue background. <clears throat> and this is a typical average response, and this is with uh, uh, skin electrodes, not, <coughs> not with a corneal electrode. We usually do two one minute runs and Red and green are just the two runs superimposed. And we found actually it's fairly reproducible because remember at 3.8 hertz for a minute, and we have about 180 stimuli that you're averaging. So even though the amplitude isn't nearly as large as with a corneal electrode and a flash response, you're gaining a lot of signal to noise by all the averaging going on. I think, I think Quentin did some preliminary studies to optimize the stimulus if I remember and search on, Wu search on. okay right there. yeah hi <laughs> you're at Columbia now right yeah okay we're done good <clears throat> there's kind of two timelines 
of the literature on this, and I'm not going to take the time to summarize it all, but um, one of the most interesting studies was in McCakes showing that in monkeys that if you put in tetrodotoxin, you could eliminate this photopic negative response. And also with induced high intraocular pressure spikes, you could reduce it permanently. This was a reversible one with a tetrodotoxin. And there's been a number of clinical studies, probably some of the people in this room, I know, I see some here, use a photopic negative response in both humans and in mice. Um, so that's nothing new, but I think what is nice about this, and here are some of the ones used in optic neuropathies, is that in a busy clinic, in a neuropathology clinic at least, we would never send these people to an ERG lab even for a photopic test. It's just too much hassle and interruption. But if you just do this right in the lane before they're dilated, it takes one or two minutes. That's pretty easy to do and that doesn't really disrupt the clinic. So I thought that was really a nice part of the instrument is that very easy to use in a clinic setting without too much effort and cooperation on the part of the patient. Uh, this, everybody in this room probably knows this. Um, the other little twist about this is, as you know, the ReadyVal uses the entrance pupil size to calculate the, the light intensity of the stimulus so you can have trollins. And so to do that, you're having to get the pupil size. So we kind of decided, why don't we incorporate a little pupil test right before we start collecting the electrical response. So we are capturing the pupil from the a still picture from the video in darkness. And then we step up of, uh, on a background. And so we're measuring a steady state pupil size in darkness and in light. So that also has a little of advantages. As someone that's done a lot in the pupil field, we're not having to measure a dynamic response and, and do analysis there. We're really just have to measure the steady state pupil size and look at the percent change from darkness. So it's an incremental pupil response that gives us information about distal to the optic nerve and the photopic negative gives us proximal to the optic nerve, what the status is. And so that's just kind of shown here. <clears throat> Here's a captured video in darkness and then in steady state light. And so uh, Quentin was able to return to us the pupil size and we calculate percent pupil contraction from, from those two images. And uh, that was just a couple seconds before the electrical response starts. The instrument can't measure, um, just because of the mechanics of the hardware, it can't measure the video and the electrical response simultaneously. But that's not that big of a deal. You tell me if I'm saying anything that's it's not uh, correct. <clears throat> this was just uh, showing the patients that we tested, which is a variety of optic neuropathy, about 51 eyes compared to 43 normal eyes. And if you just look at them as a group, there was a statistical, highly statistical difference in the uh, lower photopic negative response in the optic neuropathy. There's obviously some overlap. I'll get to that in a second. And then this is the pupil response. So this is the percent pupil contraction. So uh, better response is going up and poor response is going down. So <clears throat> there are significant deficits in the pupil response, as you'd expect. Um, and then what we want to do is put those two together and see the combined, how, how well did it do in a receiver operating curve characteristic analysis. And not too bad for first pass. So that was an uh, area under the curve of 0.92. And uh, I think we might be able to improve upon this as we're getting better at recording it. <laughs> One thing that I was uh, embarrassed to find out was that one of the nice parts about capturing those videos is you get the pupil. The other part is you can assess how good the electro placement was. And in spite of, uh, you know, instructing my very seasoned research assistants, they didn't do that great of a job in some cases. And I think Quentin's done some nice work on showing 
if that electrode is moved either down or up to the side, that will influence significantly the response. That was not done with a photopic negative. That was done with a, just a photopic ERG, a flicker, test. flicker yeah. test. So I only bring this up because if you're using this, I think even though it's a great print on the electrode, it shows what the alignment's supposed to be. It's in the instructions, but it's very critical that you impress upon who's ever placing it that they place it as close to the, as they can. And another little tip, just a practical thing, is some of the women had uh, facial hair that was in the way of the electrode, and I learned today that what Quentin says to do is just rotate it down because the other end of the electrode, <coughs> that position is not critical. That's what you said. So just some practical tips there. <coughs> but I think we would able to reduce the variability even more in the normals between subjects if we were very, if we redid this and were more critical on the electro placement. But once in the placement where you do have it, looking at the repeats, um, it's very well behaved with all that uh, averaging of all those responses. So pretty reproducible. <clears throat> I wanted to show <clears throat> a couple patients because we learned something interesting from a couple of them. Uh, what I'm showing here is the same response, but I picked out um, some patients over here because these were the six patients that had acute optic neuropathy. The other ones were acute plus had may have had it for a while. And so there was you know, an effect acutely that was within the first two weeks. Um, these, that's why I define as acute in this study. So there was pretty acute effects on the response of that neuron. And what was uh, interesting is uh, I'm going to show one patient and then a second patient that we treated with steroids that, you'll fi that I thought was interesting. Here's just a typical example of someone who had non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy in the right eye uh, a number of months ago. The nerves pale. They had an inferior altitudinal defect with central involvement. There was a lot of loss of the OCT nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell, and there was practically no photopic negative response compared to the other eye that was normal. So that would be your poster child case, easy to see. There's something going on that's wrong from the photopic negative response, and the pupil response was very uh, abnormally reduced. Here's a patient that had, uh, just for six weeks, an inflammatory optic neuropathy that actually turned out to be sarcoid, and uh, had a pretty significant central visual field scotoma and uh, was, had a reduced photopic negative response, and we treated that patient with high-dose oral steroids. And uh, what was interesting is that the pupillary deficit was still very bad, so there was still a big conduction block. But what was curious to me was that not only did the photopic negative response improve, but also it looks like the um, A and the B wave increased too. And that was kind of curious. And not only that, but it looked like it was increasing in the other eye compared to the uh, previous exam on the top. And um, so I kind of got interested in that. And uh, I guess this, I thought I had this slide up here. We found about 16 uh, reports in the literature, most of them in animal studies of regular uh, ICEV ERGs. They were done for drug toxicity studies, and they were often some of those studies were giving steroids intravitreally. And all these reports showed an increase in the ERG with intravitreal steroids. And I hadn't heard that before. So something steroids is doing to the electrical response of the retina that I wasn't aware of, but it's been reported in the literature, and there was one other human case of that. I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen that in any of your patients getting steroids, but I thought that was kind of interesting. We're going to follow up on that. So <clears throat> essentially, we're going to be studying a lot more patients acute and over time, and we're also looking at blood flow at the same time to see how that correlates with the metabolic activation of the neuron. And... Uh, 
I think the advantage from our standpoint, from a neuro-ophthalmology standpoint, is just being able to compare the evoked activity of the neurons proximal to the site of damage with the, with the distal behavior proxies and as well as the pupillary response. So uh, it's first pass, and we're not experienced electrophysiologists, but I thought it was fairly easy to incorporate in a clinical setting. And uh, the reason, of course, people would like to use it for glaucoma, but I thought it would be important to study it in maybe unilateral optic neuropathies first, have the other eyes control, really see how much it corresponds to the amount of damage. But it may also depend on the time span from when the damage is in terms of how much of a deficit you get and, and whether there's a treatment or not. So that's pretty much all I had to say. Here are the papers on the high-dose steroids, a uh, couple of them. So that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you. The question is, uh, does it matter which eye you record first in terms of the damage or the undamaged? Um, so the damaged eye was, you know, either the right or left eye, and we always recorded the right eye first, so it kind of became random. We didn't see an effect, but I'm curious as to why you asked that question. Well, I think that may be an order effect. <clears throat> what makes you think there could be? Uh, well, uh, there are some studies that have demonstrated that there is retina-retinal connections. Ah. And uh, we actually published this paper last year on, in the rat, but uh, similar things may happen in human. And that reminds me of an Arvo abstract about 10 years ago where they showed an order effect in the multifocal ERG when it depends which eye is recorded first. And in normal subjects, probably that won't matter that much. Mm -hmm. But in uh, eyes that are affected, some of the response may be either attenuated or amplified. Depends on if it's the damaged eye or not the damaged eye. Do you mean, let's say that you have unilateral damage in one eye and the other eye is, quote, normal. Do you mean that the damage in the one eye may affect the response of the other eye in some compensatory way or something yes, like that? Yes, that, that's exactly right. Is the response I mean, greater yeah. then in the... In I, the no. We don't know that. I mean, we, I mean what did you find in your... In your it, it, it is. Uh, it, we, in the rat is, dif is different. We're st still doing the human study, so I, I'm not uh, inclined to talk about the humans because <clears throat> the data are very preliminary. But the, it, one eye may influence the other eye and especially when the amplitude of the ERG is not that big, as is the case with the retival, that may have an effect uh, and also on the shape of the response. But do you mean the disease is having an effect in the other eye or this testing is having an effect? Uh, I think both could have an effect. I'll show you something. Thank you. Thanks, and just to uh, follow up on that for a second. Yeah. Omar is going to possibly address your your thing in his 600-person uh, study that he's been doing. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Very good talk. My question is, is rather simple. It's, it, uh, it, it's, it's asking about if you developed any sort of protocol um, for use of this instrument. What I mean by that is, do you take one recording, or do you take two recordings, get an average? You take two recordings, decide if they're apart by a certain amount and do a third, that sort of thing? Uh, we did two recordings uh, in each eye, and uh, we took the average of the two responses. Sometimes we did three if we thought that the, you know, when we looked at the recording right away, if it was noisy or it didn't look like it was replicated, one tracing over the other, then sometimes we would do a third. So they had to kind of look like they were superimposed for us to accept it. And just to uh, follow up on that, the, 
the Red Eval device does let you, you know, review this review and and select the traces that 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 you like in a in the replica. So when Randy or anybody else does duplicates, if they don't look the same, you can always do a third one and then throw out the one that doesn't look the same. Okay. Uh, are we talking prices at all at this meeting? No, we can do that later. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Is it millimeters or is it a ratio? Of people response? So uh, the, the question, Randy, was hmm. in your study, what was your what was your pupil what was your pupil measurement? Ah, we just took the uh, percent contraction from darkness to light, so the percent change in pupil size <coughs> in pupil under diameter? steady state conditions. Pardon. In pupil diameter. Yes, diameter, not area. Any uh, more questions? Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, Randy.